now we're recording. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to the first speaker. Our first speaker will be Professor Paula Tartikoff. Paula is a professor of history and Jewish studies at the Department of History and chair of the Department of Jewish Studies at Rutgers University, where she teaches courses on anti-Semitism, Jewish-Christian relations, and medieval Spain. She has been the recipient of fellowships from the Israel Institute of Advanced Studies, the European Institutes of Advanced Studies, the Katz Center of Advanced Judaic Studies in Philadelphia, and the National Endowment for Humanities. Her new book, Conversion, Circumcision, and Ritual Murder in Medieval Europe was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2020. Her first book, Between Christians and Jew, Conversion and Inquisition in the Crown of Aragon, 1250 to 1391, was published by Penn Press back in 2012. Her articles have appeared in journals, including the Jewish Quarterly Review, Speculum, Jewish History, Medieval Encounters, and the Journal of Medieval Iberian Studies. And at this, I give you Professor Paula Tartico, please. Thank you so much, Effie. Can everyone hear me? We're good? Okay. It is such an honor to participate in this celebration of Professor Kanner Fogel's wonderful new book, um, and especially to do so together with my esteemed friends and colleagues, Dr. Pinchas Roth, Moshe Yagur, and Ahuva Liberalist Neumann. I'm especially moved to be part of this event as it is sponsored by the Center for the Study of Conversion under the leadership of Effie Shoham Steiner. Um, the center has played an important role in my own research. In fact, I think I first met Professor Kenner Fogel at one of the center's wonderful conferences and very fortunately our paths continue to intersect thereafter at the Katz Center, at the Israel Institute for Advanced Study and at conferences um, of the Association for Jewish Studies. I am profoundly grateful to Professor Kanar Fogel for his generosity as a teacher and as a mentor. And it's truly a privilege to be discussing his new book in this forum today. So thank you so much, Effie, for inviting me. And it's truly a pleasure to be here. In my remarks this evening, I'd like to do three things. First, summarize what I understand as one of the central arguments in Brothers from Afar, and I'm sure Professor Kanarfogel will correct me if I get things wrong. Second, comment on this argument's great significance. And third, pose two broad questions that I hope we'll have a chance to discuss later in the program. Brothers from Afar positions itself as, and is, a historiographic intervention in which Professor Kenner Fogel revises a position that was held by the esteemed late Professor Jacob Katz, according to whom Rashi's lenient approach to apostasy and reversion long held sway in medieval Ashkenaz. For those of you who have not yet read the book, let me explain. Around the turn of the 12th century, the preeminent medieval French commentator on the Bible and Talmud, Rabbi Solomon ben Isaac of Troyes, known as Rashi, famously taught that Jews who converted to Christianity were still Jews. In keeping with this principle, Rashi ruled, for instance, that bills of divorce that apostate husbands gave their Jewish wives were fully effective, and that money was not to be lent at interest to apostates. In addition to stressing that in spite of their sins, apostates were still Jews, Rashi also advocating easing the path of repentant apostates who sought to rejoin the Jewish community. He favored their swift reintegration and he prescribed for them no special rituals or penitential rites. The late professor Jacob Katz maintained that Rashi's lenient approach to apostasy and reversion which stressed that apostates were still Jews and advocated easing the reintegration of repentant apostates into the Jewish community was dominant among rabbinic elites in Ashkenaz until the 15th century. By contrast, in Brothers from Afar, Professor Kanar Fogel demonstrates that medieval rabbinic opinions on apostasy and reversion in fact ranged widely. 
through the meticulous analysis of the writings of Ashkenazic authorities, including material preserved in unpublished manuscripts. Professor Kanar Fogel shows that from the late 12th century onwards, some leading rabbis in Northern Europe, in fact, took a stringent approach to apostasy and reversion, even more so in Germany than in Northern France. These late 12th and 13th century rabbis downgraded the status of unrepentant Jewish apostates in marital and economic issues. And they mandated that repentant apostates perform acts of penance and undergo a special ritual immersion in order to rejoin the Jewish community. Individual authorities invested this ritual immersion, which interestingly Christian sources describe in detail as well, as Professor Kennerfogel discusses in his book. They invested this ceremony with distinct meanings and consequences, which included viewing the ritual immersion of repentant apostates as spiritually and physically purifying, as an act of penance, and as a way of formalizing reversion to Judaism. Professor Kanar Fogel's documentation and analysis of this diversity and growing stringency of rabbinic opinions is significant for several reasons, and I'm going to focus on two. First, as Professor Kanar Fogel shows, this range of rabbinic approaches toward apostasy and reversion had important implications for the subsequent evolution of Jewish legal thought. It shaped the decisions of authorities in medieval Spain, as well as the influential rulings of Rabbi Israel Isserlein in 15th century Central Europe. Second, and most relevant to my own work, Professor Kenner Fogel's recovery of the complexity of rabbinic positions on apostasy and reversion enriches our understandings of Jewish attitudes toward these social phenomena, which were a critical feature of Jewish life and a key aspect of Jewish-Christian relations. As I have demonstrated in my own work, Jewish-Christian conversion during the Middle Ages was a dynamic and multifaceted phenomenon. It was not only about Jews who were victims of Christian violence or lone Jewish intellectuals who converted to Christianity, nor was it even only about conversion from Judaism to Christianity. Instead, Medieval Jewish Christian conversion involved Jewish men, women, and children turning to baptism under a wide range of circumstances. It involved many of these individuals later seeking to return to Judaism. And as Professor Kanarfogel discusses at length in his book, it also involved a small number of born Christians formally converting to Judaism, some of whom later returned to Christianity. So, Jewish Christian conversion at this time was a bi-directional and variegated phenomenon with major implications for Jewish self-understanding, for issues of Jewish communal cohesion, and for majority-minority dynamics. The more stringent 12th and 13th century approaches to Jewish communal gatekeeping that Professor Kanar Fogel details, which entailed cutting off apostates from the Jewish community more fully and making the path of return more arduous would seem to reflect increasingly harsh Jewish attitudes toward Christian culture, Jewish apostasy, and even toward apostates who professed remorse. For instance, the requirement of ritual immersion for repentant apostates would seem to have reflected beliefs that baptism and life as a Christian were spiritually and physically contaminating, that Jewish apostasy was a grave sin, and that apostates who professed remorse had to exert themselves in order to repair their status in the Jewish community. Professor Kanar Fogel's delineation of these nuanced developments in medieval halakha is a feat unto itself. Yet this book goes even further. In an effort to explain why rabbinic rulings became more stringent over time, Professor Kanar Fogel seeks to connect the intricacies of halachic discussions on manuscript folios to broader historical trends. And this brings me to the third part of my remarks in which I'm going to raise 
two broad questions. Professor Kanner Fogel suggests that these shifts in rabbinic rulings regarding apostasy and reversion were in part a response to changing conditions of Jewish life and in particular to developments and expressions of Christian anti-Judaism. Let me say a word about these developments. Christian anti-Judaism existed in medieval Europe long before the 12th and 13th centuries, right? One need only recall the massacres and forced conversions of Jews at the dawn of the First Crusade to understand that Christian anti-Judaism had terrifying consequences in Rashi's day. However, new expressions of Christian anti-Judaism developed during the 12th and 13th centuries, which were also destructive. These included the circulation of anti-Jewish accusations of ritual murder and host desecration, which themselves often sparked anti-Jewish violence. They also included the subjection of Jews to Christian conversionary sermons, and by the end of this period, uh, expulsions of Jews from multiple realms. Patterns in Jewish apostasy also changed during the 12th and 13th centuries. To be sure, some Jews were still baptized at sword's point. However, other Jews turned to baptism themselves to escape dire personal circumstances. Moreover, and crucially, it was not uncommon for Jewish apostates to harm Jews by informing on them or denouncing them to Christian authorities. In short, while Jewish Christian relations often depended on local political, social, and economic factors, overall, this was a period of great tension. So Professor Catterfogel writes, and I quote, that Tosafists may have adjusted their halachic positions in light of contemporary events as a means of strengthening their communities and protecting them from further spiritual, if not physical damage at the hands of the Christian majority and its authorities, end of quote. And my first question is this, when analyzing medieval Jewish legal writing, how do we as scholars disentangle and assess the many factors that shaped them, right? Rabbinic authorities articulated their reasoning along textual, exegetical, and juridical lines. Indeed, Professor Kennerfogel shows in detail that evidentiary rules, the range of juridical options available on a particular matter, and whatever was at stake for Jews in a specific case, all played decisive roles in a rabbi's ruling. Furthermore, even as some 12th and 13th century rabbis were stringent and increasingly so with regard to apostasy and reversion, others were more lenient. In light of this complexity, how do we as scholars go about investigating the roles of broader cultural influences on medieval rabbis' decision-making processes? And how, when, and where in rabbis' decision-making processes are we to imagine that broader influences came into play. This is something I would love to learn more about, think more about, and hear um, more of Professor Kanner Fogel's thoughts on. My second question pertains to what we can learn from the sources that Professor Kanner Fogel has brought to light about the relationship between folk and elite Judaism, to the extent that these categories can be useful, and the ways they influenced one another in medieval Ashkenaz. The late professor Jacob Katz and others long maintained that the practice of ritually immersing repentant apostates was initially a folk custom that medieval rabbis eventually endorsed. However, Brothers from Afar suggests that matters were likely more complicated. So I'm curious about the extent to which the material Professor Kanarfogel has brought to light can help us clarify the relationship between local customs and the development of Jewish law, specifically with regard to apostasy and reversion. I'm curious how it can help us clarify the diversity of Jewish opinions regarding these matters beyond learned circles. And I'm curious how it might help us clarify issues of social stratification within the Jewish community more generally. Let me conclude by reiterating what an erudite and exciting book this is what important contributions it makes to the study of the evolution of medieval Jewish law, and what significant avenues of research it opens for scholars in a wide range of fields, 
including Jewish social and cultural history and the history of Jewish Christian relations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula, both for your fascinating remarks and for being so meticulous about the time. Um, our second, we're moving directly to our second speaker. Uh, our second speaker tonight is my friend, Professor Pinchas Roth of the Talmud Department at Bar Ilan University. He studies halachic literature from medieval Europe. This year has seen the publication of two of his books, uh, two new books. Uh, the first in partnership with Professor Rami Reiner of Ben Gurion University, he recently published a critical edition, an invaluable critical edition, I should say, of the response of the 12th century illustrious Tosafist Rabbi Isaac of Dampierre, Rihazaken, and his book, In This Land, Jewish Life and Legal Culture in Late Medieval Provence, was published earlier this year with the University of Toronto Press. It's the first ever book in Jewish studies to be published in the new series established by the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies in Toronto. And I think this is a quite a formidable um, uh, achievement. So at this, I give you Professor Pinchas Ra, please. Thank you. I had the privilege of knowing Professor Kanafogel, I realized yesterday, for 20 years in my lifetime. That's a lot. Dating back to the period when I worked at Professor Kanafogel's second home, the Institute for Microfilmed Hebrew Manuscripts at the National Library in Jerusalem. Since then, he's shared his knowledge, his wisdom, insight, his consolation, gossip, collegiality, a semester of guided reading, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to public, publicly acknowledge and thank him. Also, I need to acknowledge that unlike everybody else participating in this event, I'm not an expert on conversion. Therefore, I decided to focus on something that I understand a little bit better. Out of the 88 Hebrew manuscripts cited in this book, I would like to discuss a single codex and to consider its bibliographic and historical significance. The manuscript is held today in the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. The call number is Oriental Philip 1392. And it was inspected and described there by Marit Steinschneider in his 1897 catalog of the Hebrew manuscripts in the library in Berlin. Now, through Steinschneider's catalog, the manuscript came to the attention of other Jewish studies scholars. And Ephraim Elimelech Urbach made use of it in his magisterial Ba'alea Tosafot to publish a few lines from a responsum by Isaac Ben Samuel of Dampierre, Riaz Aken. It was for the same reason that we cited it in the edition of Riaz Aken's responsum that I published recently with Professor Rami Reiner. And it is the self same responsum that is discussed in Brothers from Afar on page 110. My curiosity about the manuscript was aroused first by the call number, which reflected a manuscript collection that I wasn't familiar with and that doesn't include many other Hebrew manuscripts. When I looked at the manuscript itself, which has been digitized, it's freely accessible through the website of the Israel National Library, I found that the response by Riaz Aken was one component in an entire section, two full folios from 188 verso to 190 verso, devoted to medieval response about apostates. Clearly, someone had taken a particular interest in today's topic and had put some effort into compiling a small dossier about the Jewish legal status of converts. Closer examination reveals that these responses are not simply a haphazard compilation of materials under the general heading of Mishumadim. The scribe was concerned specifically with the financial implications of conversion. The opening passage of the section asks whether a married Jewish woman who apostatized was entitled to her ktuba, her marriage contract and then whether her husband, who had remained Jewish, was entitled to inherit that ketubah if she died. From there, he moved on to the question whether, a Jewish, whether an apostate can inherit from his Jewish father. Rehazaken and his uncle Rebbeinu Tam appear regarding the permissibility of lending money at interest to an apostate. 
And on the last leaf, the discussion comes back to the apostate wife's ketubah and concludes with the position that female apostates do not truly believe in their new religion and therefore still deserve to receive their marriage settlement. The sources of these responsa are not always spelled out. And when they are, they're not necessarily reliable. Thus, the first responsum, which opens a married woman who apostatized and died, is attributed, you can see it here, ad kan l'shon dat rova puskim. This is the opinion of most of the decisors. In fact, it's a responsum by Natronaigon from the ninth century. So is the very next responsum over here, which, if, as you might be able to see, opens, So this response is attributed explicitly to Rabbi Elazar, but in fact, it is also by Natronai Gaon. This mistaken attribution, however, gave me a foothold to start making sense of this collection. As I said, the responsum appears under the name of Natra Naigon in a number of collections and manuscripts. It's included in uh, Robert Brody's edition of Responsa by Natra Naigon. In other sources, it's attributed to other people, to Haigaon, Rabbi Gershom. But the name of Rabbi Elazar, as we see here, appears only in one source, as far as I'm aware, Sefer Shibulei Haleket, a halachic work compiled in Rome in the 13th century. When I continued looking, I realized that the response of Bayri Hazaken and the opinion of Rabbi Nutam that follow in the Berlin manuscript immediately afterwards appear likewise in Shibulei Haleket. Now, to be sure, the Berlin scribe had other sources at his disposal. He quotes from Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, Smag by Rabbi Moshe of Kutzi, 13th century uh, Fr northern France, and Sefer Mordechai from late 13th century Germany. But those works, Smag and Mordechai, were widespread during the late Middle Ages and could have been available in various regions. Shibulei Halekad, on the other hand, was copied widely and exclusively in Italy. To the best of my knowledge, all extant copies of that work were produced in Italy. Now, the script of the Berlin manuscript is clearly Ashkenazic, and it's been dated by paleographers dating back to Steinschneider to the 14th or 15th century. But during those centuries, the late Middle Ages, large numbers of Jews migrated south from Germany and east from France into northern Italy. Isaiah Zonne famously noted the, signi the significance of smag as a halacha code for French Jews in Italy. And the German Sefer Mordechai was likewise an important halachic work in northern Italy, as evidenced, for, for example, by the Vercelli manuscript, a copy of Sefer Mordechai produced in Italy in 1452, that should be familiar to anyone who has peru perused, perused any of Professor Canafogel's books. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a photo of the opening folio of the manuscript on somebody's screen around here. In short, the bibliographic sources of this section on Meshumadim all point to late medieval Italy. At this point, I want to turn to the provenance of the manuscript, that is, where it is known to have been held over the centuries. Today, as I said, it's located in Berlin. The State Library there acquired it from the collection of Sir Thomas Phillips, down here, who in 1824 bought most of the manuscripts from the, the collection of Gerard Meerman, up here, a Dutch collector. Meerman, in turn, had purchased almost all of his manuscript collection from the Collège de Clermont, a Jesuit institution in Paris that was dissolved and its possession sold in 1762. In fact, our manuscript appears in the catalog of manuscripts held by the Collège de Clermont, which was published right after its dissolution in 1764. This is the description over here, it's number six. Most of the Clermont manuscripts in turn were acquired by Guillaume Pellissier while he was serving as French ambassador to Venice during the years 1539 to 1542. How do I know all of this? This is information that's based on the much larger contingent of Greek manuscripts in the Clermont collection. The catalog, as you see here, lists only 13 manuscripts. I'm sorry, the catalog lists only 13 Hebrew manuscripts. They have not been studied nearly as closely as the Greek ones, but we can see that the Hebrew manuscripts were sold along with the Greek all along the way. All right, so we've reached the Clermont College. 
And here we can turn to Jewish sources. Benjamin Richler, our expert on Hebrew manuscript collections, identified five other manuscripts that were held by the Clermont College that are still extant today. The rest of the 13 we've lost track of. Of those five, three are explicitly dated to the 15th century in Italy. And here you have, um, in the cases where I was able to find them online, you can see where, where we get those dates from. So three of the five are explicitly dated to the 15th century in Italy, which suggests that the Hebrew manuscripts in the Clermont collection were purchased just like those in, the, in Greek and other languages in Italy during the 16th century, right? A few decades after those manuscripts had been produced. This also strengthens my earlier suggestion that the Berlin manuscript was likewise, like these other manuscripts, it was copied in 15th century Italy, in our case, by an Ashkenazi Jew. Now that we've located the scribe who produced this dossier of response about Meshumadim, can we extract any information about his intentions? Urbach noted that the Berlin manuscript contains almost exclusively Kabbalistic material. To be more precise, the codex was copied by more than one scribe. The section that interests us, that includes this Meshumadim dossier, opens with a Kabbalistic commentary on the Amida. Then it copies a number of moralistic works, including Ibn Gabriel's Tikkun Midot Nefesh. Then it turns to another Kabbalistic work, Ezra of Girona's Kabbalistic commentary on the Song of Songs. Then comes the section on Meshumadim that we saw. And finally, a prayer for mystical inspiration. And here I'm really going to go out on a limb. Tamar Herzig has noted that apostasy from Judaism in central and northern Italy both before and after the 1540s, was never a mass phenomenon. In Italian states, Jews converted alone. And she places this in, in contrast to places like Spain and Portugal, where there were, was a mass movement of conversion. Now, as I said from the beginning, I don't know much about conversion. And I know that Dr. Liebelis, who's about to speak, has studied Jewish conversion in 15th century Germany. So I'm sure that you'd be able to shed much more light on this dynamic. But for my understanding, for this Ashkenazic Italian scribe who produced the manuscript, apostasy first of all raised prosaic questions about money. Which money goes to whom in the wake of conversion? But those questions were tied for him to much deeper questions of ethics and spirituality, of how best to connect to God in a world whose religious boundaries were becoming increasingly blurred and confusing. And therefore, he placed his discussion of the legal aspects of conversion within a context of, as we saw, Kabbalistic and moralistic works. The answers that he was seeking, that he, for the answers that he was seeking, he turned to the self-same medieval rabbinic sources that were presented and analyzed with such finesse in Brothers from Afar. So I hope I was able to contribute some a new perspective on, uh, on the very rich material that Professor Kanafogel has laid before us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Roth. This was a fascinating lecture and a really erudite, um, small but very, very uh, precise study. Um, uh, we're moving to our next speaker and we're moving to another realm of the Mediterranean. We began with Iberia, we went up to Provence in Italy, and now we're going to be landing in medieval Egypt. Uh, the man who's going to shed some light on medieval Egypt and the lives of Jewish converts and converts from and to Judaism in uh, medieval Egypt is my friend Dr. Moshe Agul. Uh, Dr. Moshe Agur is a social historian of the Jewish communities of the medieval Islamic Middle East. One of his main areas of interest is interreligious interaction on various levels and forms. His dissertation written at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem examined cases of conversion to Judaism and from it in medieval Egypt using the Cairo Geniza documents and other contemporaneous sources. The dissertation received a special commendation by the Middle East and Islamic Studies Association known as ILMA of Israel for a 2020, uh, for the year 2020, and won the new and prestigious Yuval Hyman Prize for Outstanding Dissertation in Jewish History by the Zalman Shazar Center, awarding the winner 
with the possibility to publish the dissertation as a book with this publishing house. Um, his current project focuses on the shared and mingled dwelling patterns of Jews, Christians, and Muslims in medieval Egypt and Syria. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan and at the Center for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters at Ben Gurion University. And he's currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Tzvi Yavitz School of Historical Studies at Tel Aviv University and teaches at the Department of the Land of Israel Studies at Bar Ilan University. Moshe Yagul, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Effie. Can everybody hear me? See the PowerPoint? Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be here um, as part of the events of the Center for the Study of Conversion. And I've met uh, Professor Kana Fogel and Professor Tatakov and many others for the first academic time in the first international conference of the center in 2014. And I would like to start by um, thanking Professor Kana Fogel for, for his research. Uh, I used my dis in my dissertation uh, the articles, some of the articles that he, um, that were the beginning, the first steps of writing this, uh, this book. And I uh, was honored to, to get the book and continue to write and revising my dissertation only recently uh, due to the generosity of Professor Karnafogel. So I thank you, Professor Karnafogel, for your generosity, for your help and for your, for your study, for your research. Like uh, everybody said before me, very meticulous, um, very thorough and much needed um, in, his, in its details and in its uh, larger, broader concepts and, uh, and rethinking of, of these issues, even for me, uh, or especially for me as a scholar from the other side uh, of the Mediterranean and of the religious boundary from um, Islamic studies, so, or Jewish studies under Islam. And um, so my dissertation was about um, conversion to and from Judaism. And this is my, I guess this is my angle here uh, um, this evening. And so I thought, uh, the subtitle of the book, uh, of Karna Fogel's book, is Rabbinic Approaches to Apostasy and Reversion in Medieval Europe. What if we try to write uh, a book about rabbinic approaches to apostasy and reversion uh, in medieval Islamic lands? And the answer is that it would be uh, very difficult, I think, uh, I mean, I mean post, uh, post Gionic period. 10th, 11th century forward, and it will be very difficult. It will be a very thin book because we have almost no uh, queries, no responsa, and almost no other rabbinic materials uh, that, that discuss the phenomenon. Just to give you just a few numbers, we have about 500 um, responsa of uh, Maimonides. Two of them relate to conversion. One from the manuscripts that we know, the medieval manuscripts, and one that was found in Geniza, two out of 500. Uh, his son, Abraham Maimonides, we have six out of more than 150. And we can do this again with, with the Rif, uh, with the Rimigash and, and, and others. And so it will be uh, very difficult to have, the, to understand the rabbinic approach and the questions, for example, that Paula raised will be, will be impossible to answer. Um, but of course, then we have um, the Karoganiza documents, a different genre, um, and maybe we can use them to understand, if not the rabbinic approach, the or approaches then uh, the social reality, as Paula said, of, of conversion. And so I would like to see with you what can we do uh, with, with these sources. So Karoganiza documents and the few responses that we have um, all show that there was a various uh, context between, there were various contexts between uh, Jews and apostates in, in uh, medieval uh, Islamic lands. Of course, some converts, maybe most of converts, we don't know, chose new life, new path, new names, new places uh, of dwelling, and we know nothing of them. But there were enough apostates who remained in close contacts, and in con close contacts, I mean, uh, trading with Jews, working with Jews, living side by side in the same court, house by house with Jews, um, testifying 
in courts, fighting with Jews, uh, and have familial ties with Jews, okay? Remaining ongoing ties um, between Jews and apost and apostate Jews. This is what we have from Karo Geniza evidence, and this is in line with what we have from the few responses that we have. Where alongside the responses that we have from Ashkenaz uh, about what should we do with the Ketuba of the Meshumedet or with um, the poor, with, poor uh, Aguna of the Meshumad and so on, we also have proofs about ongoing contacts with apostates, not because uh, we have a, a financial issue with them and not because they want to return, but because we have a, an apostate friend and we host him. Can we feed him unkosher food? Because he doesn't care, right? So can we feed him unkosher food? Can we drink his wine? Even, is it permissible, or let me, well, the phrasing is, um, a Jewish apostate woman, if a Jewish man fornicates with her and she's married to another Jewish apostate, is it really fornicating? Or maybe this not, these are not really marriages, so this is not really fornication, right? So these are the kind of questions that we find in Islamic, in, in sources responsive from Islamic lands, which I think we find less um, in, in Ashkenaz, in medieval Ashkenaz, as we see from the sources uh, that Kanafogel brings in, in his book and his other articles, that at least some of the queries in the response literature and the Karoganiza documents reveal a reality of ongoing contacts with apostates as apostates, not because they are a, a trouble for us and not because they are want to return. So this is one a point that I want to raise. Another point that I want to raise is nomenclature. And again, from what I understand, and I'm sure that um, Professor Kanafogel and, and all you others could correct me, the term that is used almost exclusively in, in Ashkenazic literature is Meshumad, or of course, Mumar, if it was censored, right? Um, if, as far as I understand. And my sources uh, from Geniza and from um, Responsa literature, we have no fixed terms. We have Meshumad, but we also have a, a new term uh, for apostate, which is poshea, a criminal, uh, both in Hebrew and in Judeo-Arabic forms. It could, could be also fashi, okay, in, in, in Arabic form. It could be Arabic um, idioms, for example, haraja min el din. So he went out from the, from the religion. It could be from the din or from the madhab. So now religion is a madhab, or from shar, from, from the halakha. Uh, or uh, from the community. Um, also, you can find it both in Hebrew and in Judea Arabic, yet some in a klal, but also haraja an al klal, and so forth. And even other Arabic verse, nashaza, intakala. So we have a, a various a spectrum of terms, which I uh, raise here as a question. Can we say that the, the lack of queries in the response yeah. literature and in the Geniza and the evidence from the documentary Geniza for ongoing contacts and the fact that there is no fixed term for that. Can we gather all these uh, details into a larger picture in which, of course, there's, uh, we're talking about differences in genres and writing conventions and source survivals from um, the Ashkenazi responsa and the Middle Eastern Islamic responsa. And we have other considerations and we have, as Professor Kanavogel shows, the denseness of the networks, of rabbinic networks, how everybody is writing or referring to the um, opinions of their fathers, uncles, in-laws, teachers, and so forth. And he could uh, lay out how the differences between generations and between Fran Northern France and Germany, um, and even within Germany, we lack all that in Islamic lands, in the response of Islamic lands. But even given all that, all these disclaimers, can we really, uh, can we maybe say that all the facts, all the details add up to something to a larger picture, as uh, Professor Kanafo um, shows in his later chapters in his book. Um, I think if we try to have like a larger historical picture of it, I would say that um, 
the lack of evidence and the evidence that we do have from other genres, from other sources, all point to a much looser attitude or not even not, not one, not single attitude towards apostates. And it's part of the reality of ongoing daily co contacts uh, between Jews and apostates, which is in itself part of the even larger picture of ongoing daily contacts between Jews and Christians and Muslims in Islamic lands. And I would like to exemplify, or I think to exemplify it by uh, using two points, um, which we see in responsa literature and Karoganese evidence. So the first issue is an issue that uh, I'm, of course, I'm very much interested in, and there's uh, Professor Kafer dedicated a, a larger sections of his book and of his articles to the issue of returning apostates and the attitude towards them and the changing uh, process, the changing attitude towards them over time and over space. But if we look at the sources from, from the response from Islamic lands, we have not a single query that we know of that talks about uh, what should we do when an apostate wishes to return? Not a single one, okay? Now again, I know source survival is a thing, but not a single one. In fact, the, the single one that I'm aware of, in fact, um, one query that I am aware of founded in Geniza and is attributed to Rav Haigeron. You can see the, the relevant part here in the Judeo-Arabic, it was published by Mordechai Kiva Friedman concerns a, a, the, a cantor which in his past committed sins, did not apostatize, but he committed sins, is, is it okay for him to be a cantor? And the answer for Haigon, he says, of course that he can be a cantor, even an apostate, which returned fully, there's no problem with him being a cantor. So if an apostate has no problem, clearly this cantor has no problem. So the case of an apostate, Returning a person here is brought in as an as Kalva Homer, okay? Um, and this is the only instance, instance, instance that I know of, of um, even dealing with the issue or the non issue of returning a uh, And thanks to the Karoganiza documents, of course, we know that there were a who returned. It was a viable option. It's not because that it was out of the question, so no need to discuss it in legal literature. We have, for example, here, a letter from Yemen, 1202, after the forced conversion in Yemen, the Jews were allowed to return. This was, again, was published by Friedman. And so what did they do when they were allowed to return? So it says here in the Judeo-Arabic, and so we made it public that we observe the Sharia, the law, the Torah, and we wore the special garment of the Jews and we paid the jizya and we went to celebrate Atzeret, Shavuot, because it was uh, the evening of Shavuot and that's it. No tvila, no na paring nails and so on and so forth. That's it. Is it because it was the whole community, because it was a special case of forced conversion? So. Here we have another example, a letter of a father to his daughter. The mother apostatized and took her daughter with her. So the daughter was raised up as a non-Jew. And the father writes to her, you have to choose between Judaism and me or um, the Gentiles and your mother. And the answer is, and the letter implies that choice is possible, you but you should just choose. And we know of the case of Rabbi Yudha Levi, who offers an apostate to return. And, and other documents that all seem to imply that there is no, the only problem with going back to Judaism might be the Muslim authorities. As long as you stay out of the radar, we won't have any difficulties with you. So this is one point that we can see uh, that I wanted to raise here, the lack of any demands from returning apostles that we know of. And another point, and uh, the, the last point which I wanted to make is what we do have is a, as a like an issue, a mini issue is the circumcision of an apostate son during the Sabbath. And this we have three different examples, or actually two different queries to Rav Shriraga in the late 10th century and to Abraham Maimonides in the early 13th century. And, and the third one, which is a copy 
uh, of uh, Rav Shreer Gaon's ruling. And uh, you can see here the case, I won't read all of it, but we have here a case in Rav Shreer Gaon's query, and a Porset man is married to an Israelite, a Jewess, and they had a son who was born during the Sabbath, so he should be circumcised the next Sabbath, right? So is it permissible for a Jewish circumcisers to perform it during the Sabbath or no? And Rav Shiragon says yes, and he doesn't say yes because the mother is Jew, is Jewish. It's not, this is not his uh, reasoning, but pay attention to the reality. And a person is married to a Jewish woman. They live near a Jewish community and they are interested to perform circumcision according to the Jewish ritual in the eighth day, not in the seventh, not in the ninth, not after a year, by a Jewish circumciser. Can we do it or not? And Rav Shira Gaon says, yes, you, you can and you should do it. Why decide from the first place that this uh, apostate or his son will be um, marked as non-Jews or as sinners, okay? And this is being copied and translated to Judeo-Arabic. Here you see it in the Siddur of Rabbi Shlomo Natan, which was very popular from the 12th century onward. And this Siddur includes halachot. And one of the halachot is, what do we do with a person who Haraja Anel Madhab, yes, came out of the region, but he is married to a Jewish woman, which is st stayed in the Madhab, she is still Jewish, and it was born in the Sabbath, and during the Sabbath, yes, you, we should circumcise the son during the next Sabbath. In Abraham Maimonides, in the 13th century, we have a case of both parents are apostates, and Abraham Maimonides says, no, you shouldn't do it on the Sabbath. But again, I'm more interested in the query, in the situation, in the social reality, that, and again, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I think these kind of questions uh, and this closeness, this intimacy between uh, Jews and apostates as apostates, he is not going to return, but you can of course ask, did he really leave? Uh, I think uh, find them less in, in medieval Ashkenaz. So just to conclude, what I wanted to show, to show us here um, from Islamic lands point of view, how little we have in terms of, of legal queries, of response, of legal uh, discussions, uh, even larger legal, legal discussions. But using Karaginiza documents, what can we uh, know about the social reality? And can we combine what we know from the, the little that we know from rabbinic approaches with what we know from documented sources to combine it with what we know about religious boundaries uh, more largely um, in medieval Islamic lands? So again, thank you, Professor Conor Fogel, for um, this book and for all your studies and for also for the opportunity to speak and listen here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moshe. Thank you very much. Um, we will not uh, remain in the Islamic lands because, um, after all, um, this book is about Europe. So our last speaker before we hand it over to the uh, groom and the uh, pivot of tonight's uh, book event, Professor Kanafogel. Our last speaker will be uh, Dr. Ahuva Liberlas Neumann. Uh, Ahuva is a historian of medieval Jewish history. She completed her doctoral thesis at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, recently titled Believing or Belonging, Religious Conversion, Family Life, and the Jewish Community in Late Medieval German Lands under uh, my supervision, and Yisrael Yuvals. <coughs> she was a doctoral research scholar at the Center for the Study of Conversion and is currently a Kreitman postdoctoral fellow at the Jewish History Department at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. Ahuva spent the year of 2018-19, just before COVID, and when scholars could actually travel as a research fellow at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich, as a member of Professor Eva Haverkamp Roth's team of researchers focusing on the history of the Jewish community of Regensburg. In a couple of months, she will commence as a two-year fellowship on a two-year fellowship at the Jacob and Hilda Blaustein postdoctoral associate in Jewish medieval history as part of the program for Judaic studies at Yale University. Her fields of interest focus on pre-modern German and Jewish history from 1110 from the, elect, from the 12th century to the 16th century, uh, social and intellectual history, gender, the history of childhood and family life, 
and the study of conversion, marginality, criminality, and interreligious relationship between Jews and Christians. Ahuva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I assume you hear me. For some years, Professor Efrain Kanalfogel and I have a coffee ritual. He asks me how my 15th century converts are doing, and I enjoy hearing his latest treasure hunt for medieval rabbis who dealt with converts and religious conversion in their rabbinic writings. I listen with great thirst of knowledge when Professor Kanalfogel spoke of a manuscript he found which hints to another world view than in the printed edition, or when he found traces of Geonic or Ashkenazi concepts in Sephardi 14th century writings. I came out of each conversation optimistic that scholars, even while working on their fourth original book or after over 100 published articles, still hold such passion and enthusiasm for their profession and turn every stone to build a more complex and richer picture of the past. Today, I would like to use my short time to connect three passions of my own, which are reflected in Professor Kanalfogel's Brothers from Afar. These are medieval travel, criminality, and religious conversion. Traveling and distancing from one's home was perceived by medieval Jewish and Christians to hold both immense opportunities and great physical and spiritual dangers. When exiting the medieval gates, the person left behind many aspects of his or her social status, religious identity, and economic commitments, family, communal, and municipal structures which define them. As I have discussed in other occasions, in contrast, to many of his contemporaries, Rabbi Uda ben Shmuel Hasid adopted a unique attitude towards long distance travel. This is well documented in his writings, especially in Sefer Hasidim. Over 100 paragraphs contain statements that indicate the author's opposition to, or at least disapproval of, journeys of any sort. Highway robbers, abductors who demand ransom, rapists, and murderers threatened all who travel during the medieval era. Therefore, Rabbi Uda encouraged to avoid traveling or distancing from one's home. Although traveling and wandering was used in the 12th century as a means of repentance, Rabbi Uda systematically suggested that the sinner stay home, as tshuva was not a process a person should grapple with alone or without a community. With that in mind, Sefer Hasidim does reflect, as Professor Kanafogel discussed in his book, on the path for atonement in Shuva for one who has converted. These are the rare paragraphs in which Rabbi Uda rules that reverting apostates must leave their homes and distance themselves to another city in order to return to Judaism. The picture that rises from a number of rabbinic texts from Northern France in this period and beyond, as Canal Fugel emphasizes in his book, show a similar demand that the relapsed convert do so away from their hometown and community, since the chances of detection and retribution by Christian authorities was significantly tightened if the reversion took place where the apostate has lived as a Christian, end of quote. What began as a solution to keep both relapsed converts and the community safe was used by others as an economic opportunity. Mayor of Rottenburg, a century later, was concerned with the connection between fraud, locality, and reverting conversion. Concerning the testimony of a former convert, he states, as quoted in Brothers from Afar, page 58, one who had become an apostate and then repented, albeit not with a full heart, but rather with deceit, as it is well known, they do not consider themselves to be Jews, except in order to have other Jews give them food or in order to steal 
and to fulfill their every desire. End of quote. Kanafa got further points to suggest one can learn from this and similar rulings that at least some apostates apparently moved back and forth between these communities with relative ease. I suggest that the ease in which Jews could return to Judaism and the common request to do so in a new locale may have led in some instances to a connection between criminal activity and religious conversion. I wish to share with you one non-rabbinic source from the 15th century, which highlights the struggles, not only for rabbis, but for Christians and the city authorities dealing with conversion and travel as the means of deceit. Richard Reichelt von Mosbach narrated his life of travel, fraud, and multiple conversions in his confessions. His account was preserved in the Bekanntnis book written in the 15th century, an administrative book of confessions and protocols taken before the court in the city of Regensburg and kept in the Bavarian state archives in Munich. The text has formally been addressed by Karl Theodor Gemeiner, the Regensburg main archivist in the early 19th century, Raphael Strauss, the German Jewish pre Holocaust Bavarian historian, and also by Roni Poschia. In 1475, Reichard von Mosbach was captured and imprisoned in Regensburg after being accused of multiple thefts. In his full length confession given before the city inquisitor, the Jew who had converted and reconverted multiple times elaborated on his success in gaining the trust of numerous Jews and Christian communities and individuals. While finding himself time and again on a path leading to theft, leaving behind him abandoned wives and children, apprentices and benefactors. When he was nine years of age, he was baptized in Würzburg, where his godfather named his Richard. And I just brought a few sentences here from uh, the German manuscript translated into English. He later moved to another city where he presented himself as a Jew and allowed himself to be baptized again and was named Johannes. He stayed with a Fleischmann, a butcher. After three days with the butcher, Reichard was sent with 60 penning to buy a calf, but he fled with the money. Moreover, he confessed that he traveled to Holland where there was another converted Jew who was a doctor. He said to Richard, are you a Jew? And Richard answered, yes. And so he told Richard, there are no, Jew no Jews dare to live here in this land. Let yourself be baptized and I will help you receive many gulden. And so Richard allowed himself to be baptized for the third time and was named Franciscus for which he immediately received Gulden and clothes and stayed with him for four weeks. He then confessed that he continued to Worms, Mainz, and in Mark Magdeburg, where again, no one knew of his conversion. And so he returned again to the Jewish faith. In Berlin, he was wed, then divorced, leaving, him, leaving his wife with a son and married again another woman in Berlin. He confessed that when he traveled to Italy, to Rome and another place, he brought up Tzitzel's Apfel, Etrogim. And he sold these to the Jews in German lands for 21 years. During this time, he came and went in and out of Italy. When he arrived in the city, in a city where Jews lived, he joined in with the Jews and where he passed tariff for toll stations or was traveling on, an in, on the inter-city streets, he pretended to be a Christian. He had a franc, not sure what that is, but I'll be happy to hear ideas, on his hat, and wore a paternoster, a rosary around his neck. And it goes on and on for six pages and has a very scary twist to that. Okay, so this unique text raises many and different questions I hope to dwell on in the future leading us to re-examine the definition of belonging to local Jewish communities. 
as a fine Canafogel discusses in Brothers from Afar, cases crossing religious and moral behavior were dealt with not only by the local German courts, but was a great reason for concern by rabbinic leadership. Referred to in halachic sources as archi or reikim, these converted vagabonds were also a major concern for rabbinic leaders in the mi late Middle Ages, as they left behind a trail of abandoned wives, discarded children, and much interreligious tension. In my doctoral dissertation, I focused on converts who belonged to the mainstream of society, taxpaying citizens of the city. Those individual converts were an organic part of the society from which they came, and thus expected to be an organic part of the society they joined. My work showed the important place belonging to a family, to a community, to a specific city, impacted the outcome of a religious conversion. In this research, I add another element. Along with religious marginality, Richard and other persons who were documented in the Bavarian archival troves tell of a social and economic one dealing with persons who were not an established part of the social fabric. Did life on the road or on the margins of society lead to less social control? What was the community's ability and reach concerning these multi-time converts? To what extent and for what reason did the late medieval Jewish Christian communities spread their wings over Richard and other transgressors even in times of a shaky existence? At least from Richard's narrative and from those appearing in some medieval responsa, it seems these questionable persons were cared for by the Jewish community. Perhaps it is helpful to keep in mind the growing social gaps between Jewish citizens and outsiders, which may have led to this attitude, especially in the late Middle Ages. After the persecutions that followed the Black Death, the legal status of Jews in German lands weakened. Many cities chose to expel the Jews. Others withdrew from the guidelines of privileges granted in earlier centuries. While three cities granted citizenship to, Jew to Jews with capital, as well as to some Jews who served various communal needs like rabbis, Jews who survived on the autonomic margins without permanent income could not receive the privilege to live permanently in the city. Their status became that of a foreigner or a transit. What began as a legal differentiation between citizens and temporary residents affected many other social and religious aspects of life in the urban arena. In most cases, the non-citizens became marginalized, living on the outskirts of a specific community, while others became vagabonds. Some took advantage of the religious tension and ongoing religious competition to make conversion their profession, as we have seen in the case of Richard of Mosbach and from some halakhic writings of the time. It is quite evident from these sources that both Christians and Jews were willing to put their trust in a newcomer without questioning or dwelling on their past or former whereabouts. Kanafogel uses ritual immersion as a tool to examine rabbinic Ashkenazic approaches to conversion. In the case of what he calls flip-flop converts or converts with questionable intentions, immersion, as Kanafogel rightly explains, would not prove to be the best way to express one's new commitment to Judaism. As these converts a fraud see, uh, are immersing while still holding to their former sinful behaviors. In Hebrew, tovlim v'sheretz be'adam. I would like to add in the end that as immersion should be preferably take, uh, taking place in a Beit Din or before Beit Din, it could endanger those present in some manner, as Paula Taltakov has shown and many others, the dangers of reverting a conversion. This would be a risk that is perhaps not worth taking for a repetitive convert. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ahuva.
Um, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, but Ephraim Canterfogel is a Kohen. He's a priest, a priestly living. And uh, in the, uh, the prayers that we say on Yom HaKippurim, uh, especially in the Ashkenazi rite, the Seder Avoda uh, is uh, the, the uh, piyut that is recited to remember and commemorate uh, the work of the Kohen Gadol in uh, the high priest in the temple is called Amitz Koach. And one of the verses there, one of the lines there reads, so now we hand it off to you, Professor Canafogel, to answer and to comment and to, uh, if you wish to thank, to thank the, uh, the people who, who assembled today to uh, talk about your book, discuss your book, answer the questions that Paula has raised and others, uh, Frank Canafogel. Um, I, before I hand it off to you, I should introduce you, although you hardly need any introduction, definitely not in this crowd, uh, but for the sake of people who would listen to the recording. Professor Frank Canafogel is the Billy E. Billy Ivry University Professor of Jewish History, Literature, and Law at Yeshiva University's Bernard Revel Graduate School for Jewish Studies. He's a specialist in the fields of medieval Jewish intellectual history and rabbinic literature. He is the author or editor of 11 books in English and in Hebrew, and he is and his 100th scholarly article is now in press, as already mentioned before. He is the winner of the National Jewish Book Award for Scholarship, the Goldstein Gorin Book Prize awarded by the International Center for Jewish Thought at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, the Jordan Schnitzer Book Award from the Association of Jewish Studies. His latest book, whose publication we are celebrating today, Brothers from Afar, Rabbinic Approaches to Apostasy, and Reversion in Medieval Europe was recently published by Wayne State University Press. Professor Kander Fogel serves as editor-in-chief of the academic journal Jewish History and is a fellow of the American Academy of Jewish Research. And at this, I hand it over to you, Professor Kander Fogel, please. Rabbi Effie, thank you very much. Uh, thanks first to you and to the center. Uh, um, this center has been very good to me has caused me to make many trips to Israel, which is to my benefit. And I hope that we'll go, we'll go right back to that. I'll tell you, I'll be in already the second week in November, and we'll, uh, I, I come into the Sifriya um, meet and Efri's, Efri's in his seat towards the stairs in the back, like it's to the balcony. And we continue conversations as if there weren't seven or eight weeks in between, but that's about all there used to be. It's been a different year, so it's wonderful to be with all of you and so many of you who, who are my friends and buddies at the Sifriya and Hashivenu Venashuva, Chadaish Amenu Kikedem. I, I want to thank all the speakers. Eh, I must say, I'm, I didn't think I would be <laughs> but it really is uh, very, very wonderful to be the, uh, the, the, the old guy in the room, the Chatan Danan. Um, and I want to thank each of the presenters individually. Uh, and I'll do that in a minute as I make some remarks about what they said, but really that, that people, uh, uh, you know, spend such good time and good effort and come up with some interesting, such interesting observations having to do with things that I wrote is still, what can I say? It still is really a very exciting and a very humbling thing. Um, I, I could go on and on about all the shvachot for not just Eretz Yisrael, Medinat Yisrael, Sifriyat, uh, Sifriyat Lumit, and all of my colleagues. I'll leave that. We'll get to some more as we go along. But let me let me talk to each of the presenters for a moment and, and thank them and make some comments. And I'll use the Mishnaic idiom, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, that you start with phrase one and go to phrase two. Let me start backwards. Let me start with Ahuva. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to cite Ahuva's excellent doctor, the doctoral dissertation in my book. Uh, once I read it, that it really is excellent. I could have, should have, might have, but it wasn't out really yet. So I didn't have that opportunity. However, uh, as she indicated, her interest and her expertise in this field is really very impressive. And you will get a chance, a little plug for the sponsor, one of the sponsors. Um, she has an article coming out in the journal that I co-edit with Jay Berkowitz, who I think is on the line here too, Jewish History. Uh, we have a special edition of Sefer Hasidim. A bunch of us here are in that one too. Um, and uh, she has a wonderful article on travel and Sefer Hasidim. And so you'll get to really see her 
excellent. That was more of her MA work, but you'll get to see that excellent work as well. Uh, Ahuva, thank you very much for, for focusing attention on what is one of my favorite uh, little parts of the book, the so-called flip-floppers, the uh, um, serial converters. I think I coined that, that phrase, not in, the United, not, in the, not in the New York and not in Jerusalem, but actually in Philadelphia. Paula might have been at that time at the center as well. And the colleagues there liked it so much that I put it in the book and the indexer decided to have an index on flip-floppers. And there are quite a number of pages about it. Um, and, and it's clear that you, you were right to put emphasis there and there's a lot to look at there. What is the flip-flopping about? Is it religious, economic, cultural, political? The answer can well be yes. Um, so thank you for drawing uh, attention to that. Um, and uh, I was very gratified to see as I went through the Kitvayad that in, you know, not just in these sort of more unusual places, I Chuvot Rashba is not unusual. He's citing his teacher, Rabbeinu Yona, describing his own experience in Northern France, um, but not just Sefer Chassidim, Riyav Dampierre in one of his technical Chuvot stresses the need to change venues. So you've really pointed out some, you put your finger on some very important things here. And uh, I just noticed, Ahuva, I'll, I'll add, I was just uh, sort of checking as you were speaking at the end, um, Jewish History is now publishing your writing. Uh, it has published your late father's writing, uh, Alav HaShalom, a uh, review of one of his books and so on. So I think that might be one of the earliest um, father-daughter uh, uh, publications. And uh, for that, you should, be, uh, you should be proud and you should be blessed. Um, and we'll turn to, we'll have to now, I'll have to now go to New Haven to have coffee with you, not as, not as, as quite as exciting as Jerusalem, but I get to New Haven too when my friend Ivan Marcus calls me. Um, Moshe Yagur, um, whose dissertation, whose excellent dissertation, I did have the opportunity to cite in uh, my book. And when Moshe said he'd like to do approaches, uh, rabbinic approaches to a apostasy version in the medieval Islamic world to talk about that, I said, oh, Zeya Sefer Shalcha. But of course, as he indicated, there isn't all that much material on the rabbinic side. Nonetheless, um, uh, Moshe's excellent dissertation um, does bring, and I used it to bring uh, European rabbinic uh, uh, sources and figures into conversation with uh, rabbinic figures in the Islamic world, not into direct conversation, but into intellectual conversation. And I really must say that between Moshe and, and Ahuv, and I have another thing to say about Moshe in a moment, it's very gratifying to see I came to this topic uh, you know, not so late in my career, but uh, I had already written a few books and I sort of happened upon this, uh, not quite by accident, we'll talk about that in a moment, um, but it's very nice to see such excellent young scholars who really are, are bitchilat.com, they're starting out, they've done their doctorates, they're not at the very beginning, but they're there towards the beginning of their, of their uh, uh, you know, professional teaching careers and so on, and they're doing such good work in terms of Mishum uh, Adim, very difficult topic because you have to, as, and we'll get to this, you have to be very careful when you assess what's causing these changes. And I'm really very gratified um, that, that scholars of this type uh, and of these two in particular are doing this work. Um, uh, Moshe, the point that you make about the lack of queries in Spain, um, in, in I should say in Geonic lands, in Geniza lands, in, in the East um, is exactly part of, and I, I had to deal with this and it, it, it concerned me for a while until I realized that it was gonna be okay. I wish I had given some of your statistics. They're very helpful about how much is not in the earlier uh, sources, you know, never mind Truvot Harambam that are in Arabic and may, might not have been so accessible, but uh, Rimigash, Rif are writing, if not North Africa, then in, in Spain, Rimigash and Rif. And these don't make much headway either because there's very little. Um, and so uh, when uh, Rashba, Ritva, even Ramban and others have to deal with these topics, they turn right to Ashkenaz. They turn right to the Northern European scholars, which is not uncommon for them, but it's almost a deafening noise that comes from the North. And that is because precisely as you indicate that there seems to be such little discussion in these Eastern rabbinic sources. Now, of course, this may have to do with Christianity versus Islam, right? When ge there are Geonic responses, when the Geonim talk about uh, apostasy, are they talking about uh, Islam or Christianity? The answer is usually Islam, but as a number of studies have shown by others, uh, the answer might be yes. Is it Islam or Christianity? The answer is yes, it may be uh, both. So this is again, a very important point and I'm really glad that you put your finger on that. Just interestingly, uh, you know, one specific point, the connection between apostasy and Chazanut, 
uh, uh, you know, a returning apostate and his ability to be a chazan or a posheya's ability to be a chazan. Chazan is one of those categories that, of course, has this great sensitivity. And so you'll find even in Or Zarua and Ashkenazic sources, a number of uh, uh, linkages between apostasy and other shiot, uh, you know, avirot chamurot. So again, I think that that's a very well done um, well done issue because these Chazanim did have a higher, returning to Chazanut is quote unquote on a somewhat higher standard. Um, I remember very well the first time I met Pinchas Roth in the Machon Tatsumi Kitayad. What he didn't tell you is that as a young man, I guess he was doing his Tari Shon or was, he was working there. And he had the uh, unfortunate job of having to go through some of my earlier books and to type into the catalog where I refer to certain manuscripts. He did a terrific job and that's how he, that's how he met. Um, and I am so pleased that he is Professor Roth, Magialo, the Odioter, and uh, his, uh, uh, you know, he's becoming prolific, as Effie indicated, and I salute that um, as well. Um, and indeed, the Mahon Tatsumi Kitayad is my second home. I miss my chair. I miss my spot. Um, and uh, again, I'm, I can't wait to return to Bezrat Hashem soon. A couple of comments, Pinchas. First of all, Philip 1392, one of my favorites, precisely because Urbach had trouble reading it, not his fault. We now have a much easier time uh, reading it with a digitization. Um, so Urbach made some beginning conclusions, but it, it needed work. And, um, uh, 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 you know, so so you, you, that, that focus is important to me, number one. Uh, by the way, I'm also, I checked as you were speaking, I'm very happy to say that when I cited this manuscript in terms of Chuvatari, I was able to mention the Roth Reiner volume. Uh, I have to give them both credit as they were working on their book. I kept saying, no, you know, Otek, you have a copy for me so I can cite it. It went through a few Gilgulim. And one of the last things that I did in the footnotes was to put in the pagination of the actual volume. So uh, I'm actually, I'm very glad that I was able to get that in so I shouldn't be uh, embarrassed in any way. Um, the, um, as far as the, uh, uh, the interesting uh, Gaonic material, there is a bodily in manual Manuscript. Now I'll have to take a look. I have to do some homework. Thank you. Uh, Bodley, and I think it's uh, a Neubauer 820, which is a Gaonic collection of Chuvot on Mishum Adim. Uh, Natronai is mentioned, others are mentioned, and I'm wondering if there might be some uh, connection between some of these, uh, some of these texts. And um, uh, I'll just also, so, so thank you for that. I think, again, you're, you're on to something there. And I'll also just conclude by saying, um, you know, in this Eidan uh, Hazumim, we were all on Zooms constantly. Uh, Professor Roth, uh, I heard him on Sunday, Monday, I believe, on a completely different topic. He was excellent tonight and he was excellent then. So he really is becoming, when, when you have to do two or three Zoom talks a week, you know you've made it. So, Magielecha, Professor Mazaltov. Okay. Um, Paula, thank you very much for um, your really um, very um, uh, uh, focused and, and, and elegant comments. Um, I should say, and I say it in the book, but Professor Katz is my doctor father. <laughs> I had the schutak dola of writing my dissertation in the States for Professor Katz. After he finished being the rector at the University of Rit, he was a mere 67 or 68, which is he always put it, I'm a young man. He came to New York for four semester olives in a row. I don't know why, but I sat with Professor Katz and uh, I did my dissertation on Jewish Education Society, what became my first book. And he was Manche Adir, not just because of his wonderful personal characteristics, but he was Choker I couldn't, I couldn't do anything wrong. He would not let me make any mistakes. And, I, and so if I didn't, it's because of him. And so when I, when I was working on the material in this book and on you know, preparing it, I kept asking myself, how come I'm coming to a, such a different conclusion than Professor Katz? And there are people on the Zoom who I will not mention uh, who know. Good scholars, when you argued with Professor Katz, he could be 90 years old, he'd argue back. And he would tell you, lo karat nachon, ta'ut, this, that, you know, nituach lo nachon. He, as polite and as wonderful as he was, he was iron, he was amud barzel, he didn't move. So I kept trying to play him, you know, I stood down a couple of inches and I said, what would Professor Katz say? And the conclusion that I came to time and time again, at least the one that I used to comfort myself, blame it on the Kitve Yad. Professor Katz just did not have these kids. They just weren't around them. They weren't accessible. And I, I actually, Badaktipam, uh, 
one line from Bodley in 692 or one, uh, you know, Keta, one section uh, from Simchav Shpira was published by Kupfer, not so clear either, in his Chuvotu Psakim in 1973. Professor Katz was then still alive, very, very vigorous. That was the only line that, as far as I knew, appeared in print. So to expect him to then rethink everything he had done based on that one line, assuming that's that's not not uh, not fair. So that's what that's the conclusion that I came to, um, and um, uh, and so it's it's you know again I was also very careful in the book for that same reason. Professor Katz's notion of Afpi Shechata Yisrael who, and the fact that Mishumadim are bottom line Jewish, even if you know essentially Jewish, even if they are not eligible for certain mitzvot or to participate in certain things, that part of his thesis doesn't move. It's just that now we have a whole second or third or other position. And so that's really the work. So you picked that up pretty well, actually. Um, and I, I want to say a word about some of your more important questions. I can't answer them all now. But the question of how do you know when you read rabbinic literature, how do you know whether to make it a matter, as you say very correctly, you know, they were sitting in debate midrash, and this one went this way, and the other one went the other way, and they developed new positions. So I think for me, there are certain, there are several indicators here. Um, uh, to use very crass terms, volume, noise, and chidush. Um, in other words, and I know all kinds of things about angle of deflection, it doesn't really work here, so I'm not even going to go that way. When you start to see a certain groundswell at a particular point in time, which gets only louder, again, so if they say, well, that's what my Rebbe taught me, or if they say, well, we have this and we're expanding it, okay. But everybody here is trying to top the other one with chidushim, new ways of looking at the old thing. And there's a kind of an urgency here that, that, again, because of the volume, because of the noise, and because of, you know, these were very intelligent people, because of the effort being made to give more and more reasons, something is bothering them beyond just interpreting Talmudic texts. Never mind that there isn't a lot of Talmudic material in the Talmud itself, I mean, on Mishumadim. If you look carefully at the book, and, and you all have, which is unbelievable, <laughs> um, a lot of the material is in Chuvot, Psakim, Ha'arot. In other words, these are not things that came up in the Beit Midrash. These, many of them came up from Ma'asim Shahayu, and so Vishayihiyu. And so if you put it all together, the other thing is breath. Uh, not that you breathe, but uh, uh, um, as I pointed out in that same chapter where I talk about the reasons, uh, Rabbeinu Tam's position, that very famous position, or the cutting down of Rabbeinu Tam's leniencies in terms of um, uh, Mishum Adim coming back and marrying people who had converted and so on and so forth, you see a systematic cutting down of his position along the same timeline. Now, the truth is I have an article in press uh, in the Not Secret Lasker Jubilee volume where I talk about Rabbeinu Tam, the genius, being cut down a lot. But that's not what was happening here. That's, this is just, you know, example number seven. They were talking about Rabbeinu Tam, where we see that Rabbeinu Tam was, you'd expect everybody to always agree with Rabbeinu Tam about everything. Um, although that too is more than just an issue of how you decide matters of Jewish law. But when you put the, the, the again, the noise, the volume, the chidush all together, it, it was hard for me to sit and say, well, they were just learning sugyot and, and they somehow came up with these, uh, you know, sort of new, uh, new interpretations. Again, precisely because they also were put immediately into play. That's the beginning of the answer. Um, there's more to say, but, but it's a very fair and very important, um, very inf important question. Um, again, even the, sort of Germany outdoing northern France and vice versa. Um, teachers outdoing students in ways that are not typical. You know, again, Tosafists will always fight. They love to fight and they love to disagree with their teachers. But there's a certain, a certain um, again, a noise in, in a good sense is the best term, certain volume there that I think hardly um, uh, will hardly uh, be simply a matter of Talmudic uh, interpretation. As far as your other important point about folk versus elite uh, Judaism, 
So it's actually here too, and this sort of serves to answer the first question as well in part, it's another dimension. Um, what Professor Kotz says is he does, he, he cites literally three examples <clears throat> of rabbinic sources that seem to recognize immersion for a returning apostate. And one of them is the uh, Chuvat Maram that Ahuva cited about the flip-flopper. So it's not clear how much the Meshiv is recognizing the Tevila. The question is, you know, Tovel Vesheretz Bi Adam, what exactly is he talking about? I think that's what he's talking about, but it's not, not crystal clear. Uh, one of his sources is Sefer Hasidim, Katz, that Sefer Hasidim knows about, seems to know about Tevila, right? Uh, this immersion, uh, Mayor of Rottenburg, uh, maybe knows about it. And he quotes the Mukeo safe, which is really that smoking gun Ritva. But again, Professor Katz, it wasn't a smoking gun. So Professor Katz's contention is that till the late 14th century, you basically have three, which are about one and a quarter references to this in rabbinic sources. As far as he's concerned, Tevila is a tofa popular. It's a, it's a, it's a popular, it's an, it's a, a folk custom, right? Which may be a couple of rabbis tolerated, recognized, but even there, it's literally a couple, right? The data that we have says that that is absolutely not the case. In other words, again, I, I because it's my Dr. Vater, because he was great, okay, I leave open the possibility that in the early phases, there may have been a popular version of this that gets sort of accepted by the rabbis. Also, what colored this, uh, Professor Yerushalmi, Allah HaShalom, with whom I also studied, he used Katz and Katz used him, right? We have Bernard Guy, others uh, uh, of these popular conversion things where Jews, uh, 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 Bernard Guy and others report that uh, uh, Jews were who returned were thrown into these, I call it the mikveh from heck. They were thrown into this terrible mikveh experience and they're you know, rubbing on the chrism where, 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 the, where the oil had been poured and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and so Yushami says, listen, it looks like a popular thing because I can't find it in any codes. And writing in 1970, he surely couldn't. So he says it must be Katz's idea, it's all popular. And Katz sort of was reinforced by that too. It looks like a popular venue. By the time you get through all of the rabbinic texts that that not only uh, uh, acknowledge Tevila, but that, that you know, champion it and that improve it, then the question is among the students, Tevila may not be enough. Right. And, and, and you know, uh, that goes to Germany, too. So this is not just a, a folk rabbinic interface. This has really now be, been taken over by the rabbinic establishment. And so that nexus has been sort of separated, even though and especially, you know, my friend Alicia Baumgarten and her group Daily Life in Ashkenaz. Obviously, we have to keep an eye on it. And you're right. And, and some of the, some of the wonderful texts that you have, which are clearly popular texts, we have to figure out how to integrate them. But in terms of my basic argumentation, I, I think you can you can sort of I don't mean separate in a negative way, but you can sort of, you know, take the rabbinic material and run with it. Um, uh, you know, assuming that the popular again, assuming that there were people, you know, it's it's the old question of the congregants being more observant than the rabbis or less. Apparently, the 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 the, the the populace was not uncomfortable with that to begin with. Anyway, but these are these are not full answers, but these are really just uh, responses to your very um, your very important questions. And again, um, here's a case in Paula's case. Um, she's a uh, you know I'm 102, so she's many years younger than me, but she's not a beginning scholar, and she's doing all this wonderful work. Um, uh, on conversion, uh, and uh, again, I hope that we'll we'll have more. Uh, just uh, final words here again. Uh, really, miragesh. You know, I'm not my usual hilarious self because that's really Um, um And um, I, again, I, I what's interesting to me is, as I say. Uh, this is not where I began some of my work. Uh, what I wanted to do in this book was take this really close reading of rabbinic texts, identifying who, what, where, in every way, and bring it forward, and doing it in history of halacha, and yet, despite what I just said to Paula, 
um, in a way where it really is part of the Jewish community. This is not extrinsic, even if it's more rabbinic than lay in terms of the theory. Um, this obviously has tremendous uh, implications for Jewish communal life. And so, um, so I came to this, as I say, a little bit late in the game, and I'm very privileged and pleased um, that, uh, that all of you, and, and, and Pinchas is being modest, uh, he's dealt with Mishum Adim in other contexts too. I have citations from his dissertation in the book and other such things. Um, to have scholars, younger scholars, and, and, and other uh, seasoned scholars such as Paula doing this work really uh, in such a strong way. And um, as for me, I think the next two books will be back to the old story, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I've only mapped out two. Uh, we'll see if your comments are, you know, keep them coming. And uh, maybe the third one, Bitar, uh, can possibly uh, go back to this. I thank you all very much, Laila Tov in Israel and Sarayim Tov here in the States. And again, thank you so much for this attention. Uh, it's undeserved but it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Not in the least undeserved, not in the least. Um, I wanna thank all uh, of the assembled. I wanna thank the speakers. Um, I think the only person I know who could mention the next two books at the apex of his uh, concluding remarks is Ephraim Canterfogel. And I can promise you that if you stay tuned, they are not going to let us wither too long. Uh, they're definitely en route to being published. Uh, so sometimes is used not as a positive way. I think that in uh, Professor Kanterfogel's uh, uh, lineup, this is definitely a compliment. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. I wanna thank you uh, to the speakers, thank the speakers, Professor Paula Tardakov, Professor Pinchas Rot, Dr. Moshe Agur and Dr. Ahuva Libalas Neumann. Uh, Hope to see you all in our further programming. Follow us either on Facebook or through our website uh, and keep joining us in these fabulous events that we're having. I enjoyed myself very much tonight and I think we all, uh, another round of applause to our participants and thank you very much. Good night thank to all. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Good night, thank you very much. תודה רבה, תודה לדוברים, תודה רבה. יאללה, בעזרת השם בניו יורק הבנויה. That's where we're headed. בעזרת השם. היה מקסים ממש. היה נפלא, נפלא, ממש נפלא. תודה רבה, תודה אפרים. יאללה, לילה טוב.